welcome to historically speaking my name is jayawardhan singh and today we are going to talk about prithviraj raso and its legacy in this space i am going to uh, talk about prithviraj raso and you know what was this text's legacy throughout the period from when it was composed and up until the modern period so we will cover the whole uh, ho- uh, whole history of prithviraj raso and how it's you know how it became an important text in the uh, rajput history and what were the effects or how it shaped the rajput history itself and we will also see uh, what were the you know how it uh, has uh, it it impacted the modern hindi movement so we will do all of this so before uh, talking about prithviraj raso i thought i will uh, you know just talk about some basic uh, facts about prithviraj chauhan and the chauhans them uh, or the you know the chauhan dynasty uh, uh, itself so so first we will start with uh, the you know th- this is the period around the end of 10th century ad and we see in north india the pratiharas you know are declining and uh, with the declining pratiharas we see that there were other powers who were once the feudatories of the pratiharas now they are becoming independent so around 973 ad we have the earliest uh, chauhan inscriptions uh, in which we we can clearly see that now the chauhans have become independent so this is around 973 ad now the period of 1000 ad to 1200 ad was the period when we see you know the the dynasties who have emerged uh, who have emerged after the decline of the pratiharas now we see that you know there is this intense struggle between different dynasties for the supremacy of the whole northern india and uh, this can be you know explained through the fact that the pratiharas after their decline have left a uh, power vacuum so to say so in order to you know become a preeminent power these uh, dynasties who have emerged after the decline of the pratiharas now they are you know struggling between each other so this was the period of intense warfare which we see in the northern india particularly now uh, when we talk about the chahana uh, chahans or chahmana chahman as they were called in the early inscriptions so uh, during this period that is the period of 1000 ad to 1200 ad we see that uh, it is the chalukyas of gujarat or solankis as we now you know most of us are familiar with them so the solankis of gujarat they were their you know prime rival uh, they were their main rival for so we see that by the you know 1137 ad uh, the famous chalukya ruler jaisim siddaraj now what he does was he conquered the city of nagor now nagor was an important city of the chauhanas chauhans and we see that with this conquest uh, the ruling chauhan ruler during this period was arno raja so arno raja gets defeated by the solanki ruler jaisim siddaraj and it appears that one of the sons of uh, arno raja whose name was someshwar uh, it is entirely not clear what happens to uh, someshwar but it it is uh, certain that he was taken by as a prisoner or as a captive we do not know but it is clear that uh, the solanki ruler takes him back to uh, gujarat with him now uh, arno raja has other other sons as well now one of his sons whose name is jagaddev jagaddev kills uh, uh, arno raja and uh, there is this text called prithviraj vijay now jagat david then becomes the new chauhan kings uh, new chauhan king and uh, all because he has killed his father this text prithviraj uh, vijay tells us that and i quote having slain his affectionate father jagat dev himself uh, he himself perished leaving behind himself a stinking name and another place you know prithviraj chauhan tells uh, pr- sorry prithviraj vijay tells us that out of all the chauhana rulers it is only jagat dev who did not attain who didn't attain heaven 
so that's this was the reput uh, this was the you know uh, what you say what we can say you know legacy of uh, jagat dev so after jagat dev uh, we are told that jagat dev uh, after jagat dev uh, vigraha raj uh, fourth becomes the next chauhan ruler and he is sometimes also called bisal dev and uh, during this period we see that you know the war with the chalukyas again began uh, began and there are uh, two important uh, cities which were uh, you know controlled by the feudatories of the chalukyas first is nadol and second is jalor now both of these cities we are told in inscriptions that vigraha raj destroyed so for example for nadol we are we are told that vigraha raj turned nadol into bed of reeds and for jalor he you know the, the city was uh, the city became the city of flames so you can see how intense this war uh, with the chalukyas of uh, gujarat was so vigraha raj also you know uh, is an important ruler because it was during uh, his reign that we find hasi and delhi which were earlier controlled by the chohanas uh, which were alter controlled by the tomars now it comes under the rule of uh, uh, the chohans and there is some uh, disagreement between his scholars whether we can say that the chohans or the tomars have become the their feudatory or not but i think personally that you know uh, after the defeat uh, of uh, the tomars by vigraha raj they were more or less the feudatories of uh, chohans and this uh, the reign of vigraha raj fourth or bisal dev as he was called is also considered uh, as the golden period of the chauhan dynasty and after uh, vigraha raj we are told that his son whose name was apar gange or sometimes there is this you know sometimes we also heard this name amar gange so he becomes the next ruler now uh, as uh, but he did not reign for long because we are told that uh, the son of jagat dev kills uh, apar gange or sometimes there is you know this confusion whether uh, apar gange was killed by jagat dev's sons or whether uh, he died in a battle we are not sure about that but uh, what is clear is that uh, this uh, jagat dev's sons become uh, son became the became the next ruler of the chauhans he is also called prithviraj second so what we find is that uh, prithviraj second who are the son of jagat dev did not rule for long and he also did not have any sons so what we see is that after his death the the rule the rule uh, of the chauhans passed down to someshwar now someshwar is currently residing in gujarat as we know that you know the uh, solanki ruler had you know taken him to gujarat now in gujarat he had already married a kalu kaluchri prince whose name was kapoor devi and he had two sons by then uh, they were prithviraj or and hairaj so around 1169 we see that you know someshwar now moves to uh, shakambari shakambari was the you know center of the chauhans so he, he moves to shakambari and we see that now someshwar has become the next king and interestingly although we see that you know someshwar uh, someshwar was raised in gujarat and uh, there are evidence to suggest that you know he was fairly treated by the solankis but when he becomes the next chauhan ruler the you know the war with the solankis or the chalukyas of gujarat uh, he he did not you know uh, abandon this war he continues this war and we see that uh, uh, the fight with the chalukyas is interesting because in the prithviraj raso we are also told that you know uh, there is this uh, description of the fight with the chauhans and the solankis of gujarat but what is interesting is that uh, raso tells us that you know the bhim dev chalukya uh, bhim dev the chalukya ruler of gujarat was slain by the chauhans but uh, that is not correct so what we see is that around 1177 uh someshwar son prithviraj now in 1177 uh, someshwar dies and his son prithviraj 
थ्री इज अराउंड ट्वेल्व ईयर्स ऑफ एज सो वी सी दैट क्वीन कपूर देवी कर्पूर देवी सॉरी कपूर देवी बिकम्स द रेजेंट एंड ही इज हेल्प शी इज हेल्प बाय बाय हर चीफ मिनिस्टर हुज नेम वॉज कादम्ब वास सो दिस रेजेंसी ऑफ क्वीन कर्पूर देवी लास्ट अराउंड आई थिंक फोर ईयर्स एंड वेन पृथ्वीराज चौहान वॉज सिक्सटीन ईयर्स ऑफ एज दैट इज अराउंड इलेवन एट्टी ए डी वी सी दैट ही बिकम्स द यू नो ही टेक्स द फुल कंट्रोल ऑफ द ऑफ द थ्रोन सो नाउ पृथ्वीराज चौहान हैज बिकम द यू नो और पृथ्वीराज थ्री एज ही इज कॉल्ड हैज बिकम द रूलर ऑफ द चौहान्स but uh, now we will talk about prithviraj raso but i think uh, apart from prithviraj raso there were uh, there are other important texts which tell us about you know particularly we are talking about not persian text we are talking about uh, uh, we are talking about the uh, sanskrit or you know indian tradition how these texts remember uh, prithviraj chauhan so in in this uh, in this text the most important text i think is prithviraj vijay prithviraj vijay is interesting because uh, first of all uh, uh, it is unfortunate that the you know the manuscript which we presently have is not complete and we even uh, even don't know about the name of the author but uh, the fact that the style of the you know uh, the writing is similar to vikramang dev charit uh, whose author was bilhan bilhan was a kashmiri brahman so because the writing style is same uh, some scholars believe that uh, this prithviraj vijay was written by a kashmiri brahman and uh, you know at the end of uh, prithviraj vijay there is this uh, section where a person called jayanak uh, appears in the in the text so some scholars believe that this jayanak was the author of uh, prithviraj vijay and he was a kashmiri brahman now this is his thesis because you know uh, in the manuscript the part where we are told uh, who is the author of this manuscript this part is missing so we have only a theory about who can be the, the author of this manuscript secondly uh, what we see is that uh, in the uh, this text prithviraj vijay uh, prithviraj vijay definitely is going to tell us about a victory of prithviraj but uh, the end part of this manuscript is missing so we are not sure about which victory of prithviraj this text is talking about but most scholar are of the opinion that this manuscript is talking about prithviraj chauhan's first victory over uh, mohammad gauri uh, so the first battle of panipat is the victory which prithviraj uh, prithviraj vijay is ultimately discussing so if that is the case what we can say is that this text is was composed between the period of first battle and the second battle so within the this period of first and second battle the prithviraj uh, vijay was composed so this is uh, prithviraj vijay which we can certainly say that this is the contemporary record of uh, uh, of prithviraj chauhan's reign and the author was certainly you know was in the court of prithviraj chauhan's now interestingly i am working on this text and uh, to my surprise when i first you know uh, uh, began reading this text we have only summary of this text in english there are no uh, english translation of this text and uh, i think uh, i cannot find the i couldn't find the hindi translation also so if somebody can uh, have this hindi translation although i think hindi translation was done but i couldn't find it now coming to raso uh, prithviraj raso as we call it uh, prithviraj raso or rasav both the words are used so rasav or raso is a you know a form of literary tradition in which we find that it is either biographical or historical in nature and most of it is poetry and predominantly the ras which we find in this is a uh, veer ras so 
this is the prithviraj raso and its nature but when we look at the language of the text this lang uh, the language of the text is a combination of braj bhasha and it also has some regional rajasthani element so in the you know in the literary tradition this language is called pingal pa so pingal so pingal is a uh, literary language in which we see that elements of braj bhasha and rajasthani are both combined whereas there is another literary language which is called dingal the so dingal is a literary tradition a literary language in which we said which we see that the rajasthani only rajasthani elements are present there is no you know braj bhasha so but the language of prithviraj raso is pingal so we have the elements of braj bhasha and rajasthani now coming to the text itself there is this you know uh, belief that there is there is a single manuscript or a uh, single text of prithviraj raso but that is not true uh, when we look at you know the different manuscripts that are available of prithviraj raso we see that uh, there are four diff four categories of uh, of the text so when we divide uh, and this is divided by you know the length of the manuscript so there are four different categories so first is laguttam raso laguttam raso or shortest raso raso sorry then we have the laghu raso which is short raso then we have madhyam raso madhyam raso is medium raso and then we have brihad raso or long raso so these are the four categories of prithviraj raso then we see that uh, interestingly when we you know analyze these different uh, categories of raso some manuscripts of uh, madhyam raso or middle ra medium raso sorry uh, does not talk about prithviraj killing the sultan so there are also some slight variation within different manuscript which is expected so this is that now coming to the author which i think most of us know is chand bardai and uh, according to the long recension or the brihad raso we are told that chand bardai uh, narrated this epic to his son jala before departing uh, for ghazni so that is how you know the prithviraj raso was passed down now coming to the dating of this texts uh this text particularly uh, prithviraj raso there is you know uh, earlier it was believed that it was you know a contemporary account of uh, prithviraj Re prithviraj srain but uh, presently uh, the present consensus among historians is that this text is not a contemporary account it was either you know uh, it it was either composed between uh, 15th or 16th century so that is the present consensus and particularly i am uh, looking at the work of cynthia talbot who wrote a book on this uh, prithviraj raso and in in this book she argues that the the text prithviraj raso was primarily composed in the uh, end of 16th century uh, ad so we are talking about the period of 1550 to 1600 so this is the period when uh, we find that uh, prithviraj raso was composed now uh, now how the for this the, uh, she presents two particular argument so first argument she provide is that when we look at the you know uh, prithviraj raso and uh, the story of prithviraj raso two summaries of prithviraj chauhan's life was were written in 1587 to 1597 and both of these summaries you know have have the same story which the raso has so this is one argument she provide uh, she provides and the second argument which she provides is that these uh, uh the earlier are uh, the earlier summaries like the summaries which were composed in 13th or 14th century ad for example there are two text uh, prabandh chintamani and hamir mahakavya hamir mahakavya 
Now, both of these texts, when we look at, when we analyze these texts, we find that the story of Prithviraj Chauhan, which is told in these two texts, are different from the story of Rasos. So, uh, the argument is that if suppose uh, Raso was, uh, was compiled or composed earlier than Prabhanda Chintamani and Hamir Mahakavya. So, Hamir Mahakavya and Prabhanda Chintamani uh, were both composed in the 14th century. Prabhanda Chintamani, we have the exact date. It is around 1304 AD. So, if Prabhanda Chintamani was composed in 1304 AD, and the version of Prithviraj Chauhan's story, which is present in Prabandha Chintamani, is different from Raso, then uh, it would mean that Raso was not, uh, you know, exi uh, didn't exist during this period. It was composed after 304 BC. So this is the broad argument of uh, Cynthia Talbot. Same is true with Hamir Kavya, where we see that the story of uh, uh, Prithviraj Chauhan in Hamir Kavya is is different from the raso so this is the broad argument which she provides to argue that it was uh, the prithviraj raso was either composed in 15th century or in 16th century now coming to the uh, manuscript itself the oldest manuscript of prithviraj raso was found in a village called dharnojwali which is in gujarat and this manuscript is the Laguttam, uh, Laguttam Raso or the shortest Raso. <coughs> and we see that, you know, uh, this, uh, this Laguttam Raso, there is only two, there are only two manuscript of Laguttam Raso. First is this, then there is another inscription, uh, then there is this another manuscript. Now, in this uh, manuscript, we find that particularly in the Laguttam Raso, both of these manuscripts, we see that, you know, the Braj Bahasa which is used is more archaic. When we compare to the Braj Bahasa which is used in the medium or in the short, medium and long Rasos, so uh, Laghu, Madham and Brihad Raso, the Braj Bhasha is, you know, more modern. So the Braj Bhasha of 17th century and 16th century, the kind of Braj Bhasha which is used in the text of this period appears in the uh, appears in the medium, short and long uh, Rasos. Whereas the shortest Raso or we call them uh, or we call it Laguttam Raso. Laguttam Raso's Braj Bhasha is more archaic. So this would mean that uh, this text was either composed in 15th century or late 16th century. So this again proves the, you know, the date of Prithviraj Raso. Then we have uh, the short or Laghu Raso, which we have only five manuscripts and the oldest dates to around 1613. Uh, the medium Raso has 11 manuscripts and it dates to around 1635, the oldest. And most of the, you know, the common uh, Raso, which we have in, which most of us know about, or the large number of manuscript which we have of, is the Brihad Raso or the Long Raso. We, we, we will see why that is the case. Uh, present, uh, uh, just some, uh, some, after some time. So, this is a broad, you know, argument. Uh, this is a broad overview of the different kinds of Raso which we have and the dating. Now, if we believe that according to Cynthia Talbot that this text was composed around the end of 16th century. If we believe that, what we see is that when it was composed, you know, immediately or rapidly after its composition, this text becomes, you know, greatly popular among the Rajput courts. Why we can say that? Uh, there are two, uh, there are two versions or the, there are two, you know, main argument that points to this fact. So the first is, uh, we have Aine Akbari of Abul Fazal. Now in Abu, Abul Fazal's Aine Akbari, we find that after the description of the second battle of Tarayan, uh, the story which is uh, told in Aine Akbari is similar to that of Raso. 
so this would mean that now it is also interesting that abul fazal also had you know accounts of uh, tabakat e nasri and other persian text but he did not choose those text instead he relied on raso so this is quite important so if ayn e akbari you know was compiled around 1597 so f- around 1597 1597 the compilation of ayn e akbari was complete and the oldest manuscript which we have is around 1610 so this would mean that you know uh, uh, before 1597 uh, the prithviraj raso was already you know circulating within the royal uh, rajput courts and also the moguls were also familiar with it so which we can see clearly because you know if uh, abul fazal is writing the whole story of uh, the whole story of prithviraj chauhan after the battle of the second battle of tarayan and he is using the story which is told in raso so it is quite clear that you know raso was raso had already become popular in the mughal court as well so this is uh, so uh, what we see is that uh, during the period of akbar by the end of akbar's reign raso had become you know as a official historiogra uh, official history text of the rajputs and this is what you know we see in the in ayn e akbari and interestingly uh, what we uh, in both raso and uh, in both raso and uh, ayn e akbari prithviraj chauhan is not associated with ajmer because Uh, it is entirely you know most historians are clear of this fact that during the reign of prithviraj chauhan it is the city of ajmer which was the center of chauhan power delhi was not uh, did delhi did not had the status which ajmer had during this period it was only during the reign of iltutmish particularly the his reign of 26 year we see that you know delhi had become an important political center but before this period it was ajmer which was you know the center of chauhan power but interestingly when we read raso or when we read the section of uh, ayn e akbari particularly let's talk about ayn e akbari first uh, because in ayn e akbari what we see is that the you know uh, raso is uh, the story of raso is discussed in the section where uh, ayn e akbari describes the different subas and their history so in the delhi suba we are told the story of the story of raso and uh, and the raso also you know when we read raso itself we find that in raso also delhi is the center of prithviraj chauhan's rule so in raso we are told that you know before receiving ajmer from his father someshwar uh prithviraj chauhan has already had the king uh, ha- has already had the city of delhi because uh someshwar's uh, wife was a tomar queen but most scholars are of the opinion that uh, this is not true because the mother of prithviraj chauhan was a uh, ch- princess of chedi dynasty from the tirupuri uh, region that is that uh, which is situated in central india uh, this bijholi in rock uh, rock inscription you know this talks about the lineage of prithviraj so- chauhan so it is from this inscription we can say that you know uh, prithviraj chauhan was not the son of a tomar princess as it is you know believed and even raso tells us that but that is not the case now uh, why did we see that you know uh, raso for raso uh, delhi had become the center of prithviraj chauhan's political power whereas we know that this is not the case ajmer was the center so why did raso you know uh, chose uh, delhi to become the center so this has to do with the fact that uh, as i have already told you that uh, during the early medieval period particularly we are talking about from the 8th century bad to 12th century ad delhi was not the you know uh, 
main capital of the Delhi was not an important city and particularly not as important as we see in the Sultanate period. It was uh, so there are you know different uh, uh, evidence which we can say. So first uh, for first of all, when we look at urban <coughs> Al Baruni's account, we see that in Al Baruni's account, Delhi does not find any mention. Then uh, even the other text of this period. there is no you know this evidence that delhi was a important political center there are some jain text which tells which talks about delhi but here the importance is religious for the jains only and not it was never a important political center so uh, uh, so that is the case in on the opposite we see that ajmer was the center of uh, uh, center of political power of the chauhans and this we can see also in the persian text because tabakate nasiri tells us that ajmer was the seat of chauhan power so this is important so uh, as i have already told you that you know it was only during the reign of iltutmish we see that you know the transformation of delhi as an important center of uh, political power and by the 14th end of 14th century you know most of these uh, uh, travelers for example if we talk about ibn batuta he he tells us that uh, the city of delhi was the capital of entire hindustan and by the mughal period you know, babar calls delhi his uh, daral uh, daral mul uh, sorry uh, daral mulk which means seat of the empire uh, and uh, we all know that you know humayu also uh resided in the city of delhi itself and interestingly in the uh, reign of akbar although he did not spent much time in delhi but uh, in the sanskrit inscription of this period we are told that uh, uh, akbar is described as dilleshwara which means you know lord of delhi so this is an important a uh, point where we can see delhi has become an important political center and by the reign of shah jahan uh, you know he 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 built then an entire uh, new city in delhi so this is the broad you know point where we see that you know delhi is certainly becoming more and more important and that is what we see in raso so since raso is construct uh, raso according to modern scholars was compiled during the period of 14th and uh, sorry 15th and 16th century that is why we see that the kind of in, importance which uh, uh, delhi had is uh, portrayed in prithviraj raso and uh, also in prithviraj vijay we have not you know great mention of delhi and the importance which delhi has so the broad point is this that for raso Delhi was the Chauhan uh, Prithviraj Chauhan was the king of Delhi Ajmer was not as important as Delhi whereas when we see you know during the period of uh, during this sultanate period the importance of Delhi is increasing but uh, in the same time we see that you know important uh, Ajmer is losing its importance so Uh, during the reign or uh, during the period of sultanate period particularly what we see is that uh, ajmer becomes the you know contentious uh, city where we see that you know the rajputs and the uh, sultanate uh, there are you know long period of struggle where this city passes from uh, from the rajputs to the sultanate and from sultanate to the rajputs so this is what we see in the sultanate period but by the reign of akbar particularly in 1568 we see that Aj ajmer you know he, uh, he finally conquers ajmer in 1568 and from 1568 uh, ajmer's important uh, ajmer's importance has not you know been a political importance so what we see is that now ajmer had become a uh, a center of a sufi shrine so uh, so the work of uh, akbar was that he you know lavishly spent money on the construction of the sufi shrine of uh, uh, the tomb of khwaja muiduddin uh, muiluddin chisti so during the uh, during the reign of akbar we see that uh, 
द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ अजमेर हैज हैज शिफ्टेड टू फ्रॉम पॉलिटिकल टू रिलीजियस सो दिस इज वॉट वी सी इन इन द दिस इज वॉट वी सी वॉट हैपन्स टू द रोल ऑफ द रोल ऑफ अजमेर एंड डेली इन रासो now uh, we are still on the dating of raso because i think this is the most important point now there is a text which was composed in 1585 which is called surjan charit now surjan charit is uh, a text that talks about raja surjan who was a hada chauhan of bundi and uh, this text describes you know his uh, his different his story and in this text we also get a summary of prithviraj uh, chauhan and uh, but and uh, of his you know whole history and the story which is presented in surjan charit is similar to that of raso so the fact that surjan charit was composed in 1585 and it has uh, elements of raso in it would mean that uh, raso had already become popular in the rajput the circles or, or in the rajput courts before 1585 so this is uh, you know one point so what we see is that uh, this all of this means that by the end of 16th century uh, raso had become an important text for the rajputs or uh, and uh, it is you know it it is circulating in the rajput courts and most of the uh, rajputs were familiar with this text and now when we look at the you know the oldest manuscript which is dates back to around 1610 what we see is that this uh, manuscript was created for a rathod rajput of a big of the bikaner branch so and uh, so this is uh, this 1610 manuscript is of the Uh, is the laguttam raso so the sh- shortest raso and uh, what we see is that the earliest manuscript of laguttam raso and also of laghu raso now both of these manuscripts were you know were associated with the rathod uh, rathods of bikaner so they, this 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 is the one clan you know which we can say uh, you know uh, greatly patronized the compilation of uh, compilation or preservation of raso apart from the rathods of bikaner we see that you know the kachwahas also patronized raso because there are several manuscripts that were uh, that were you know compiled d- in their court so uh, one uh, one one important manuscript we are told you know refers to a refers to chandra singh so chandra singh was the nephew of maharaja man singh so this is how we can say you know the the uh, the different rajput uh, royal houses are patronizing the uh, the raso and this this tells us that for the rajputs the importance of raso we will see how impo- why this importance was so when we analyze the raso itself what we find is that uh, the central event of the entire raso whether we are talking about the laguttam raso laghu raso madhya raso or dhirg raso in all of the four different categories of raso we see that it is the kannauj episode or in the uh, shortest recension the term is sorry in the longest recension that is in the dirgh raso the term is used is uh, kanvaj samay so k- samay means canto or chapter so the kannauj episode of the raso is the central episode in the entire raso and this episode is divided into three parts so first we see uh, so the first segment is the segment where prithviraj chauhan uh, goes from his capital delhi so here again you can see you know prithviraj chauhan's capital is delhi not ajmer so here we see you know prithviraj chauhan uh, goes from his capital delhi to kannauj and this uh, segments all this segment also talks about the description of kannauj how beautiful this uh, this tech uh, this uh, how beautiful this city is so this is the first segment 
देन वी सी द सेकेंड सेगमेंट वेयर वी आर टोल्ड यू नो पृथ्वीराज चौहान एंड चंद बरदाइज एडवेंचर इन कन्नौज एंड द इलोपमेंट ऑफ सम योगिता सो दिस इज द सेकेंड सेगमेंट द सर्ड थर्ड सेगमेंट टॉक्स अबाउट द बैटल विच वी सी यू नो आफ्टर चंद्र आफ्टर पृथ्वीराज चौहान इलोप्स संयोगिता एंड द बैटल विद द कन्नौज आर्मी एंड इज हंड्रेड सामंत सो दिस इज द दिस इज द थर्ड सेगमेंट ऑफ कन्नौज एपिसोड एंड दिस थर्ड सेगमेंट इज समाइम्स कॉल्ड संयोगिता हरण वी कैन ऑल सी वाई दैट इज द केस नाउ coming to this important uh, this uh, particular segment where we see you know the battle with the different samantas uh, sorry the battle of uh, the samantas of prithviraj chauhan with the kanauj army is quite important for the entire raso and it is the key episode of uh, the raso because you know when we uh, look at the raso itself and we read the raso for the prithviraj chauhan's military career it is not the battle of uh, the 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 battle of tarayan with mohammad gauri which was important which which was the main which was of main importance but it is this battle with the kanauj army which uh, prithviraj chauhan as and his 100 samantas fought which is the most important uh, key which is the key episode of prithviraj chauhan's military career now uh, to give you the importance which uh, raso associates with this kanauj episode when we look at the laguttam raso or the shortest raso we see that you know half of the text deals with this episode that is the kanauj episode whereas one fourth of the text deals with uh, the episodes related to mohammad gauri so you can see how important this uh, kanauj episode was for the uh, for for the raso and now this had two reason uh, the the importance why this was so important had two reasons first it highlighted the uh, so the first reason was that this episode of kanauj provided the explanation of why prithviraj chauhan's mighty army and we are told you know prithviraj chauhan had defeated uh, mohammad gauri several times so why did he eventually you know gets defeated by gauri so the explanation which is provided is because of this kanauj episode kanauj episode was the reason why prithviraj chauhan was defeated now we will see why that is the case so the second reason uh, which we see is that the reason why prithviraj chauhan is defeated by uh, the is the reason why prithviraj chauhan is defeated by mohammad gauri is because his samantas or uh, there are 100 samantas which we are told you know accompanied prithviraj chauhan in this abduction of samyogita so in this uh, Uh, in this episode when you know prithviraj chauhan takes some yogita and goes uh, uh, is going to delhi what we see is that uh, the samantas these 100 samantas of prithviraj chauhan uh, uh, perform the rear guard action in uh, to in order to you know defend prithviraj chauhan so in this rear guard action we see that around 38 samantas according to prithviraj uh, in according to prithviraj raso these 38 samanta lost their life so the fact that these uh, these 38 samantas who were you know were great warriors the fact that they lost their life during this episode this was the reason why according to this is the reason which we can you know uh, comprehend that uh, prithviraj chauhan ultimately uh, was defeated by uh, by mohammad gauri so so this is uh, what Uh, this, so this is the kanauj episode now in the kanauj episode as i have already told you that it is the the f- battle with the kanauj army which is the most important if we can say the most important point where we see prithviraj chauhan for prithviraj chauhan's military career and 
when we look at the uh, the uh, the description of prithviraj chauhan samantas we see that you know you can see how why for the different rajput clans of 14th and 15th century sorry 15th and 16th century uh, this text became so important so in the uh, in the lists of samantas we are told that these samantas belonged to different clans and of these clans some of the clans are mentioned by name so these are chauhan rathod pundir pundir guhil badgujar parmar kachwaha and jangra so these are the you know clans from which uh, these samantas belonged now there are different uh, lists of clans which are present in different manuscripts but these 1 uh, 2 3 4 uh, these eight clans are we can say you know present in almost all of the different manuscripts so uh, so this is what we see you know the fact that this uh, text talks about the bravery of the ancestors of different rajput royal houses and it also acted as a sort of legitimate uh, uh, as a legitimizing agent that uh, it shows that you know earlier uh, they were they fought bravely for their uh, for their king who was prithviraj chauhan and it is from him we see that you know ultimately they get the recognition that they belong to a you know certain class or an an elite warrior group so this is how we you know this is why the prithviraj raso is so important for the different royal houses of the rajputs now interestingly uh, i think most of us have heard this phrase that you know one warrior is equal equal to the strength of 1000 uh, sorry 1 uh, lakh warriors so this phrase you know appears in chandra uh, chandbardai's prithviraj raso itself where we are told that you know the 100 samantas of prithviraj chauhan is uh, now these 100 samantas one samant is equal to 1 lakh uh, soldiers of kannauj uh, kannauj's army and we also see that you know when they when this text describes the uh, the qualities of these samantas the term which is used is rajputi so rajputi uh, this 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 appears only in the long recension of uh, of the prithviraj raso and rajputi quality of the samantas literally means the kshatriya uh, the pride and prestige of kshatriyas so in order to defend or you know safeguard their rajput uh, this uh, uh, this rajputi quality the samantas of prithviraj chauhan laid their life against you know to protect uh, their master or to protect their lord uh now as i have already told you that uh, prithviraj this you know description of different clans of rajputs or the samantas who belong to different clans of the rajputs uh, the importance uh, is you know also is also highlighted by james todd itself uh, james todd himself because uh, what james todd argues is that uh, the making of the rajput great in the making of the great rajput tradition this uh, this you know uh, prithviraj raso had an important role to play and uh, there is this uh, line in prithviraj uh, sorry in james todd uh, james todd's account where uh, you know this is brilliantly reflected so i want to quote this so uh, i quote in the 69 books comprising 100000 stanzas relating to the exploits of prithviraj every noble family of rajasthan will find some record of their ancestors it is accordingly treasured amongst the archives of each race having any pretension to the name of rajput so you can see that you know uh, this uh, the description or the name that one finds of his ancestors in prithviraj raso this provides a certain form of legitimacy and it also you know can provide us a sense of pride that uh, the ancestor of a particular rajput clan fought with uh, prithviraj raso so in that way we can see you know 
how important this prithviraj raso was in shaping the whole rajput culture of medieval period so this is one section now interestingly uh, in prithviraj raso we also see that you know the role of mewad is also very important for the raso because you know around uh, we we all know that you know the 16th century particularly the reign of akbar was the period when there is this intense struggle between the rana of mewad and uh, the mughal emperor and even during the reign of jahangir we see that you know this struggle continues but uh, with uh, this uh, treaty with amar singh and uh, and jahangir what we see is that you know uh, the there was still this struggle which is going on with the rana of mewad and uh, the mughal emperor but now the struggle has shifted to more of a cultural realm and there is this scholar who talks about this you know cultural struggle with the rana of mewad and uh, and and uh, the mughal emperor because what we see is that by the second half of 17th century so we are talking about 1650s onwards so we have maharana uh, jagat singh now jagat maharana Jan jagat singh you know um, he he you know he uh, he we what one of the most important literary contribution during his reign was that uh, he com he commissioned a highly illustrative illustrated manuscript of ramayana and this took around 4 years to get completed so the fact that you know the maharana of mewar patron is patronizing great important uh, hindu epics tells us that you know for uh, uh, there was this effort by the rana of mewar to you know to be seen as the 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 center of you know the what we can say to a certain extent is that the hindu the the hindu sovereignty you know resides in the rana of mewar so this is what we see and uh, this uh, competition or this you know sense of being the leader of uh, the rajputs uh, different rajputs clan which the ranas believed that they were so in this we see that uh, one of the main efforts which was uh, which the rana of mewar did was that they also you know compiled the longest recession of prithviraj raso so the dirgh recession of prithviraj raso which which is the which is now the most popular recension of prithviraj raso was compiled in udaipur from 1635 to 1703 so during this period we see that the compilation of the dirgh prithviraj raso happens in udaipur and it was this uh, it was this uh, this recension of prithviraj raso that ultimately becomes the most important uh, Uh, the most important you know uh, the most important pa uh, version of prithviraj raso now in this uh, in this long recession we are talking about we will just talk a little bit about this longest recension or dirgh raso as, it, as it's called so what we see is that what you can see is that there are some elements of you know the period during which it it was compiled we see that the kind of socio uh, socio cultural uh, society of the rajputs which uh, which is present during this period is also gets reflected in this text so what we see is that uh, this in this longest recession there is this emphasis on swami dharma swami dharma literally means you know the service which you have to pay to your feudal overlord or your lord so uh now why that, that why we see you know there is this so so much emphasis on swami dharm so according to scholars uh, the rajput society of this period you know particularly we are talking about the medieval period and that is the period of late 16th 17th century so in this period what we are seeing is that the intense warfare is going on particularly you know rajputs are fighting uh, uh, fighting in the mughal armies and because you know there is this so much uh, warfare that is going on there is the and there is this need to mobilize you know large sections of rajput society so in order to do that we see that 
you know there was this need to to have a ideology where obedience to your master or obedience to your rajput head of the of your clan is quite important so so what we see is that uh, the rajput society of this period is becoming more and more centralized so the head of your clan is much more has more authority and more power compared to the earlier period so this is what we see during this period according to cynthia talbot so this uh, you know this need to uh, this need to mobilize a large section of rajput society and also able to govern uh, also able to you know discipline this large section and and did this need you know gets fulfilled by prithvira uh, prithviraj raso now it is quite clear you know why swami dharm had become so important so swami dharm uh, to summarize is uh, uh, is important because you know if if we are you know living in a martial world of this period for the rajputs it was very important first to effectively mobilize then to consolidate their authority you know among different rajput sections so for example if you know a rajput uh, leader is going on a battle then he wants to have a effective control among his uh, among his you know among his different uh, sections of soldiers so here what we see is that this uh, this you know emphasis on discipline and obedience which we see in the uh, swami dharm which is portrayed in in prithviraj raso th that greatly helps in all of this so that is why we see you know swami dharm has become there is this emphasis on swami dharm now interestingly earlier what we see is that for the rajputs one of the most important and i mean this is the this is the key uh, before this medieval period was that of all the different sins which could be committed by rajput one of the heaviest sin was the killing of a uh, rajput of uh, if a rajput kills uh, another rajput who belongs to the same gotra so this was called uh, this was called bandhu dosh so or also it is called gotra hatya so this was the heaviest sin which one rajput could commit i think it it you know it was somewhere you know close to if you are killing a cow or a killing a brahman so after these two sins it is i think the most uh, uh, heaviest sin that one rajput could commit but uh, so what we see is that in the earlier period this was the main you know kinship loyalties were the most important and that is why we see that gotra hatya was considered you know a very big deal but by this period what we see is that uh, swami dharm had you know taken the had the importance of swami dharm has increased whereas uh, if someone because in the duty towards his overlord commits bandhu dosh or commits go hatya it is not you know it is not it was not considered a sin so to give you an example uh, in the prithviraj raso we have the example of a samant of prithviraj whose name was nidur ray Ra, uh, nidur ray rathod so nidur uh, sorry nidur Ra, ray rathod what he uh, he is considered a brother of uh, jaychand so uh so uh, since he was the brother of jaychand which which would mean that uh, he and jaychand both both had the same gotra now what we see is that when prithviraj chauhan is go, uh, uh, retreating towards delhi and these samantas are fighting with the armies of kannauj uh this uh, nidur ray rathod you know uh, meets the brother of jaychand whose name was veerchand now veerchand was since he was also a brother of jaychand that would mean that both veerchand and nidur ray rathod are both of same gotra so what he uh, nidur ray rathod does is that he kills this uh, veerchand uh, so in a earlier period this would mean that you know for nidur ray rathod he had cultivated he had committed the ultimate sin because he had killed he has done a gotra hatya or bandhu dosh but 
बिकॉज स्वामी धर्म इज सुप्रीम दिस गेट्स यू नो नलीफाइड सो हेयर यू कैन सी यू नो वाई हेयर यू कैन सी वन एग्जाम्पल वेयर वी सी यू नो स्वामी धर्म हैज हैड बी हैज बिकम मोर इम्पॉर्टेंट दैन ए किनशिप लॉयल्टीज विच विच वॉज विच वर अर्लियर कंसिडर्ड मोर इम्पॉर्टेंट नाउ सो दिस इज अबाउट द ब्रॉड यू नो समरी ऑफ वॉट वॉट वर द इम्पॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स इन पृथ्वीराज रासो बट आई थिंक इन द कॉलोनियल पीरियड आई वॉट वी सी इज दैट वन ऑफ द मेन पर्सनैलिटीज हु यू नो ग्रेटली पब्लिसाइज्ड दिस पृथ्वीराज रासो अमंग द वेस्टर्न सर्कल्स एंड प्रोवाइडेड एज ए फॉर्म ऑफ लेजिटिमेसी वॉज जेम्स टॉड and it was uh, james todd uh, uh, james todd had visited udaipur in 1806 but what we see is that in 1818 to 1822 so in this four years he had he had chosen udaipur to become his uh, for his home base and he was the political agent of the british uh, to the western rajput states so in during these four years he became you know more and more familiar with the prithviraj raso and particularly the version but particularly the longest recession of prithviraj raso so uh, so this you know this uh, information or his familiarity with prithviraj raso ultimately meant that it uh, the kind of uh, uh, the kind of a uh, publicity we can say of prithviraj raso which uh, uh, james todd uh, did, uh, did was uh, ultimately meant that it was treated as a real historical document and it also gained a considerable attention among the western audience so this is what we see is uh, happened during the uh, during the period of james todd and from this period onwards and up to i think for nearly a half a century no one really questioned that uh, this was not a historical you know a completely historical document there are some you know uh, it 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 is not a contemporary account so it was only around i think in 1950s or sorry in the early 18th century early 20th century we see that you know there were questions raised by uh, different historians to uh, for the validity of this uh, this text so this is about the colonial period now interestingly prithviraj uh, raso had uh, also played a important role in hindi movement so we all know that you know hindi movement began around uh, 1860s where we were particularly in the in the the movement the center of hindi movement was the city of banaras ilahabad particularly the eastern up and avadh region so earlier you know the demand was to allow nagri script in power, provincial government and also in legal courts alongside urdu but gradually we see that you know it suddenly you know it gains momentum and it becomes a important uh, it becomes a great movement and in this movement the role of prithviraj raso was immense because prithviraj raso was considered uh, was considered the first text of hindi language and it also you know it it also portrayed a sense of uh, a martial spirit, spirit of the rajputs so it it also told the story of how you know rajputs had success, uh, uh, rajputs had defended against the muslim con- conquest so for the uh, for the hindi movement and particularly you know there is this whole uh, book where uh, we talk where the scholar talk about how you know the hindu nationalism the rise of hindu nationalism and the rise of uh, hindi movement uh, uh, also takes inspiration from prithviraj raso so this is what, what we see one aspect of prithviraj raso and uh, uh, to give you an example you know how important prithviraj raso was for the uh, hindi movement uh, we all have heard about nagri uh, nag uh, nagri pracharani sabha of banaras so the first complete edition of prithviraj raso and uh, this is the longest recession of prithviraj raso so the first published edition of uh, prithviraj raso was published 
बाय नागरी प्रचारणी सभा ऑफ बनारस बिटवीन बिटवीन 1906 एंड 1913 एंड इंटरेस्टिंगली इफ यू यू नो सर्च फॉर पृथ्वीराज रासो टुडे इन आर्काइव डॉट ऑर्ग यू विल फाइंड दैट इट इज दिस रासो विच इज प्रेजेंट प्रेजेंट सो सो इवन टुडे द मोस्ट द मोस्ट फेमिलियर रासो वॉज पब्लिश्ड बाय नागरी प्रचारणी सभा सो दिस इज वॉट you know how important prithviraj uh, this is so you can see how important prithviraj raso was for even the hindi movement itself so i think uh, i have uh, covered most of uh, some of the aspect of uh, prithviraj raso's uh, uh, prithviraj raso and i will end this uh, this talk with a verse of raso itself now i couldn't find the original verse so if somebody wants to you know search for it you can message me so i will uh, share you the details but i will you know share the english translation of this verse which i find quite interesting so this verse goes like this this world of samsar is worthless in the kali age only fame is real name alone remains from age to age so this is from pathviraj raso